We have had some significant life developments. I've been dreading making this video, honestly. I kind of wanted to update you guys on what's going on behind the scenes. Last week's video was pretty controversial. I think we kind of need to talk about that as well. We think of our YouTube audience as our family. I mean, we're in the comments with you. We read just about everything you have to say. Yeah, we think about you guys all the time. We may talk to you more than our own family sometimes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely all of the time. On July 6th, our dog Indiana Jones passed away. She was 15 and a half years old. It was sudden, it was unexpected. She had a sudden gallbladder failure. Uh, we tried to save her. She was in the emergency room for- Three days. Three days, yeah. There was nothing they could really do to save her. It just happened all at once. She was in really good health up until her last days. I mean, she was playing, she was doing everything. Mm -hmm. She made it all the way up here to Alaska. Yes, a life dream of mine for her. I just couldn't, the whole time that we brought her up here, I could not believe that she was actually gonna make it. You guys are honestly probably the 10th person to find out, all three million of you. So of all the important people in our life, you might be the most important to talk about this with. And he was a rescue dog. I got her when I was 19 years old. I'm now 34. I always wondered how old I would be. Yeah, I mean. It's a long life. That's a really important part of life. Really important part. Indy's the reason I know Zach. Yeah, without Indy, we wouldn't have met. It's profound how things happen like that. Bree was on the internet back in, what, 2010 or so? Mm -hmm. 2009, looking for leash pulling advice. So that's how she came across my videos. Bree sent a tweet to me when I was in New Orleans doing a, a project at the time. Oh yeah, you met Indy that day and she gave you a bloody lip, she I did. remember. She was jumping all over me and I picked her up and she headbutted me. Yeah, she like jumped up with her head. Yeah. I was mortified. <laughs> Indy to me was just a 10 out of 10 when it came to wrestling. True. She was such a tough dog. She used to do this thing we would call bear dog. Do any of you, I'm sure, yeah. I'm, I'm sure we didn't make that up. <laughs> she would stand on the bed on her hind legs. Well, she would bite so perfect. She knew just how hard she was allowed to bite when you would play with her, which I know it's controversial. But, but remember when she would get your arm bone in her mouth and she would do that like deep low T-Rex growl, yeah. like I love chewing on this human bone. Yeah. She really liked it. Human flesh was her number one currency. We never told you guys that, but it was true. <laughs> it was, she loved to play tug of war with your arm. <laughs> can't put this on the internet, Brie. One of my favorite you and Indy memories, we had to introduce our dogs and Zach said, before we do that, let's talk about your dog's personality. Can you sum it up in one word? Like if you had to boil it down, and I said overconfident, do you remember? And at the time, I think Zach doubted me and it has been so satisfying for him to realize that there is not a single word in our language that describes her better than that. But in the end, she actually backed it up because she lived to be almost 16. She barked away a Yukon grizzly bear. She did. Successfully protected me. No, it's a bear, you saw your bear. And she's the last of our first generation of dogs together. Like I had Venus, Supernova, Alpha Centauri, uh, and then you and I met when they were middle-aged. Mm -hmm. And so Indy was the last one to go. And she lived a long, good, happy, healthy life. True. Very healthy. I mean, she was not the kind of dog who slowed down. The reason we knew that something was wrong is because she wouldn't eat her food. And she always, always eats her food. I mean, she's one of those kind of dogs. You Loves know? her food. Honestly, have very few regrets. And I feel so good about that. Because if you'll recall, I took about 30 gazillion don't pictures of her every single day yes. and videos and I just was fully obsessed with her every minute that she was around me. And I think, I think that's the best you can do. I did it in hopes that I would feel this way. Like I really had given her all of the love that I could. There's no greater gift to a dog than to be in your care. Always looking out for her best interests, always taking agency in her health, her well-being, her happiness. I strive to be as good a pet parent as Brie is. I think all we can do is just appreciate our dogs. We all know what we're getting into when we get them. We know they're not gonna be around forever and we have to do our best to appreciate every moment with them and no one did that like you. I mean, as depressed as Brie has been, cause it's been over 70 days since this happened, I believe, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, 73. 73 days since this happened and she's only now 
at the point where she can talk about it in this manner. When our pets die, it's not always taken as seriously by everyone around you as it may feel inside of you. Like if you lose a parent or a, someone really close to you, society might give you a little bit more permission to be publicly sad. And I feel really, really sad and it's been a long time and I don't feel bad about that because I heard that the sadness that you feel is in proportion to the love that you feel for someone and I think that is really good and profound. The hardest I've ever cried over any death has been over dogs, mm -hmm. all of them. I mean, you just fall in love with them and you see how smart they are, you see how yes, capable shit. they are how much love they have. They possess so many qualities that we wish we could have, I think. They really complete us in a way and make up for so many of our inadequacies. And she was kind of like your opposite. You're shy and reserved in public situations and Indy was very outgoing, very overconfident. overconfident. Yeah. And it's kind of like you really balanced each other. It's funny how their personalities are like that. I don't know if you even chose her with that in mind to happen to be that way. But I think whatever personality of a dog you get, there's something there that just really completes us in a way that nothing else can. I definitely want to talk about some of the controversy from last week's video. I want to talk about the future of this channel. I want to take this question right now. Raw food versus traditional dog food. Raw diet is basically raw meat, eggs, vegetables, things like that. But not cooked is the point of a raw diet. The raw diet is a diet that a lot of people have strong feelings about. Some people swear by it for their dogs. Even vets who might endorse a cooked diet yep. all said raw is not the way to go. AVMA, CDC. When we got inertia, we talked to every, I mean, we talked to so many nutritionists, veterinary nutritionists all over the country. I mean, we really were willing to do whatever it took to make sure that we were giving her a good diet. And the one thing that they kept all telling us was, it's probably not a good idea to cook your own diet because dogs require nutrients in different proportions than people do. So intuitive cooking isn't probably the best idea at all. The experts that I talked to said, make sure you're using a food that's AFCO formulated. AFCO stands for? The Association of American Feed Control Officials. A lot of people really want to insist on feeding their dog a fresh diet, which I think is a great idea. Fresh being different than raw. I mean, some cooked diets still meet AFCO standards. This is convenient. But that's why Nom Nom is a really good option. They are a sponsor of this video, but I have no problem endorsing them at all. Nom Nom is actually formulated by a veterinary nutritionist for your individual dog. Mm -hmm. So it's like the best possible option if you're really worried about what is healthy for my dog. They're going to have an actual nutritionist look at your dog's stats and portion it out for you. It's pretty next level. And it's actually AFCO formulated, which for a fresh food is like seeing a unicorn, I feel like. And they send it in these little packets, which I really like because you don't have to think. If you guys want to try Nom Nom, you can check the description, trynom.com slash Zach, and you'll get 50% off a two-week trial. Last week, we posted a video on the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior's new position statement on dog training methods. The crux of that video was that they no longer support using aversive methods in any known situation. That's what we took from it. We made a 36 minute video talking about it. And so the position statement basically said positive reinforcement methods should be used for all dog training. Including is, the treatment of behavior problems, which I thought was the most profound. And I think that was where most of the controversy lied. There are still a lot of people who favor the use of aversive tools. And, and I think I understand why the biggest point that was made in the comments was, okay, fine, use it for your training, use it for basics, but difficult dogs, aggressive dogs, should you use positive reinforcement there? And that's where I think a lot of people were having a tough time accepting it. I can understand why people think that way. Before I was a dog trainer, I thought the same way. It was like, if your dog does something you don't like, punish it in some way, you know, in a humane way, but punish the dog to make sure they don't do it. If they jump on the counter, pull them down. If they jump on you, maybe put your knee up to keep them from jumping on you. Again, pre-dog training day. Well, sure, like how could yeah. they know what they're doing wrong if you don't tell them? When you tend to really do your best, and I say do your best, because I know it's impossible to be perfect. When you try to live in that positive reinforcement quadrant and you really focus on finding the most minute, tiny ways to reinforce behavior, when you do like it, it's really eye-opening. 
The thing that never ceases to amaze me about science, though, is that it is almost exclusively more interesting than anything you could have ever dreamed up when you look into the details. True. This is potentially another example of that. It's more intuitive to the average person to punish bad behavior, to discourage it from happening in the future, than it is to find positive moments in your dog's existence to reinforce to either counteract those undesired behaviors or prevent them from happening in the first place, right? That's not intuitive necessarily, yet, Science is uncovering something. It does not come naturally to me at all to think, what can I do to stop anything bad from happening before it happens? Like, I don't know, if I get a dog and I let them loose in my house, my, my natural feeling is like, take off the leash and then watch them become a tornado of destruction and see what I have to do from there. So like see them mess up and then be like, oh, that's a thing I have to fix and that's a thing I have to fix instead of just saying, I'm gonna show you how to be good. The bottom line is that the latest science seems to be suggesting that yes, even for some of the most problematic behavior problems, positive reinforcement should be used. I expected the aversives to have a higher risk of fallout. I also expected the aversives to work a little faster. It was interesting to me to see that the results didn't actually support even that. I also noticed a pretty common theme in the, in the comments to being dismissive of scientific studies. And I think I understand why that is. There are problems with all kinds of studies. I don't think any study is perfect. Definitely not the studies Far that are it. being cited about this research. Right, and if you understand scientific studies, you'll also understand that they're peer reviewed. You understand that even the person doing the experiment has to do their best to acknowledge the flaws and even state those in the experiment itself. I can empathize with that perspective because I've been there before, but as I have grown and learned, scientists go much deeper than I think the average person realizes. In fact, the scientists understand that first and foremost, your job is to be as skeptical as possible, not to infer things. A good experiment just simply states what the observations are. Things can change in light of new evidence, so we're always keeping an open mind about new evidence. I'm telling you, if it was shown that aversive methods were better for dog's welfare and at least as effective, I think I would have to consider using aversives, but right now the science doesn't seem to suggest that. We're about to start our next series. Every story is so different. This one coming up, which we are now done shooting, do you want to talk about curveball after curveball? It was interesting. Which kind of brings me to the future of our channel and where we think we need to go with it. We want to continue to do these series. Selfishly, I just, I really enjoy immersing myself in training dogs. It's the thing that I enjoy doing most. Moira the German Shepherd and George are doing amazing. I keep up with both of them regularly. They're very happy in their homes. They're doing very well. I'm so proud of them. I'm just living life. It's yep. great. Oops. Nonchalant. There's nothing going on under there to ignore. Nothing over here. Ignore. <laughs> we get our ideas from you. I hope you guys always feel liberated to request what you want to see on this channel in the comments below. Let's continue the conversation in the comments below. If you guys want to try an amazing food for your dog, check out our sponsor, Nom Nom. Trynom.com slash Zach. You'll get 50% off a two week trial. Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, I'll have links below and we will see you sometime in the future, hopefully very soon. Bye.